Desde Nueva York llegó una propuesta radical para reactivar la economía. Bernard London, un prominente inversor inmobiliario, sugirió salir de la depresión haciendo obligatoria la obsolescencia programada. Era la primera vez que el concepto aparecía por escrito. London planteaba que todos los productos tuvieran una vida limitada, con una fecha de caducidad, después de la cual se considerarían legalmente muertos. Los consumidores los devolverían a una agencia del gobierno para su destrucción. He was trying to achieve a balance between capital and labor where there would always be a market for new goods. So there would always be a need for labor and there would always be a reward for capital. Bernard London creía que con la obsolescencia programada obligatoria las fábricas seguirían produciendo, la gente continuaría consumiendo y habría trabajo para todos. Giles Slade está en Nueva York para saber más sobre la persona que hay detrás de la idea. Se pregunta si con la obsolescencia Bernard London pretendía maximizar los beneficios o bien ayudar a los parados. Dorothea Weitzner conoció a Bernard London en los años 30 durante una excursión familiar. Definitely intellectual looking. And you met Bernard London in uh, 1933. When after... I was about 16, 17, my dad and mother had this big Cadillac car, which was the size of a Zeppelin. Mother was driving like a chauffeur. Dad was in the front, and Mr. and Mrs. London were in the back of the big limousine. Dad said that Mr. London should explain his philosophy to me. He's a very interesting man. And he just told me in a few words that that was his idea to reduce the depression. We were in an economic mess, worse than today even. He was obsessed with this idea. Like an artist is uh, utterly obsessed with his paintings, you know. Uh -huh. He actually whispered to me in the car, afraid that his theory might be um, too radical. De hecho, la idea de Bernard London pasó inadvertida y la obsolescencia obligatoria nunca se puso en práctica. Veinte años más tarde, en los años 50, la obsolescencia programada resurgió, pero con un giro crucial. Ya no se trataba de obligar al consumidor, sino de seducirle. Planned obsolescence. The desire on the part of a consumer to own something a little newer, a little better, a little sooner than is necessary. We certainly in America and by now... Esta es la voz de Brooks Stevens, el apóstol de la obsolescencia programada en la América de la posguerra. Este elegante diseñador industrial creó desde electrodomésticos hasta coches y trenes, contando siempre con la obsolescencia programada. A tono con la época, los diseños de Brooks Stevens transmitían velocidad y modernidad. Hasta su casa era inusual. This is the home that my father designed and that I grew up in. When it was being built out in the suburbs, everybody thought it was going to be the new Greyhound bus station because it did not look like a traditional home. One of the most important things that my father felt always in designing a product is that it made a statement. He detested products that were bland and really uh, did not you know, create any desire within the consumer to inspire the purchase. Unlike the European approach of the past where they tried to make the very best product and make it last forever, meaning you bought such a fine suit of clothes that you were married in it and then buried in it and never a chance to renew it, the approach in America is one of making the American consumer unhappy with the product that he has enjoyed the use of for a period, have him pass it on to the second-hand market and obtain the newest product with the newest possible look. Brooks Stevens viajó por todos los Estados Unidos, promoviendo la obsolescencia programada en charlas y discursos. Sus ideas cuajaron y tuvieron un amplio eco. Women and men alike are increasingly interested in the look of things. 
They eagerly give their attention to what's new and beautiful and advanced. El diseño y el marketing seducían al consumidor para que deseara siempre el último modelo. My father never designed a product to intentionally fail or become obsolete for some functional reason in a short period of time. Planned obsolescence is, is absolutely at the consumer's discretion. Uh, no one is forcing the consumer to go into the store uh, and purchase a product. Uh, you know, they go in under their own free will. That's their choice. Libertad y felicidad a través del consumo ilimitado. El estilo de vida americano de los años 50 sentó las bases de la sociedad de consumo actual. See, without planned obsolescence, these places wouldn't exist. There wouldn't be any products, there wouldn't be any industry, there wouldn't be any designers, architects, there wouldn't be any salespeople, cleaners, there wouldn't be any security guards. All the jobs would go. So how often do you change your mobiles? 18 months. Once a year. 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 Boris Knuff da clases sobre el ciclo de vida del producto, el eufemismo moderno de la obsolescencia programada. I went shopping for you. I've got a couple of things: a pan, salt, shirt, another shirt. Se enseña a los estudiantes a diseñar para un mundo empresarial dominado por un único objetivo: compras frecuentes y repetidas. What I do, I pass these round, and you tell me what you think, how long it takes for them to fail, what the service life will be. Okay. Designers have to understand what company they work for. The company decides on a business model, how often do we want to renew our products, our offers. So this brief is given to designers, and designers have to understand and design the product in a certain way, so it fits exactly the... Uh, the business strategy of the of the client they work for. La obsolescencia programada está en la raíz del considerable crecimiento económico que el mundo occidental ha vivido a partir de los años 50. Desde entonces, el crecimiento ha sido el santo grial de nuestra economía. Nous vivons dans une société de croissance dont la logique est no pas croître pour satisfaire les besoins, mais croître pour croître, croître à l'infini, faire croître sans limite la production, et pour euh, justifier cette croissance de la production, faire croître sans limite la consommation. Serge Latouche, un destacado crítico de la sociedad del crecimiento, escribe a menudo sobre sus mecanismos. Au fond, il y a trois instruments fondamentaux qui sont euh, la publicité, l'obsolescence programmée, Et le crédit. In the last generation or so, our role in life seems to be just to consume things with credit, to borrow money, to buy things we don't need. That makes no real sense to me at all. Los críticos de la sociedad del crecimiento alertan de que no es sostenible a largo plazo, porque se basa en una contradicción flagrante. Celui qui croit qu'une croissance infinie est compatible avec une planète finie est soit un fou, soit un économiste. Le drame, c'est qu'au fond, nous sommes tous des économistes maintenant. Why is it that a new product is created every three minutes somewhere in the world? Is this necessary? I think a lot of people have realized that things need to change when they're being told by politicians to go shopping or to start consuming as the best way to restart the economy. On peut dire qu'avec la société de croissance, on est en, embarqué dans un bolide qui désormais manifestement n'a plus de pilote, qui va à toute allure et qui, dont on peut prévoir le destin qui est soit de se fracasser contre un mur, soit de sombrer dans un précipice.
Consultando manuales de instrucciones, Marcos se da cuenta de que los ingenieros determinan la vida útil de muchas impresoras al diseñarlas. Lo consiguen colocando un chip dentro de la impresora. chip, que es un, una, una EPROM, que es un chip donde es, es guarda una cuenta de impresión. Y cuando se arriba una determinada cuenta, es cuando es bloquea la impresora y deja de imprimir. ¿Qué opinan los ingenieros cuando tienen que diseñar un producto para que falle? El dilema se refleja en un clásico del cine británico de 1951, donde un joven químico inventa un hilo que no se desgasta nunca. El químico cree que ha conseguido un gran progreso. Pero no a todo el mundo le gusta el invento. Y al poco le persiguen no tan solo los dueños de la fábrica, sino también los obreros, que temen por sus empleos. Well, that's really interesting, and it reminds me of something that actually happened in the textile industry. In 1940, el gigante químico Dupont presentó una fibra sintética revolucionaria, el nylon. Para las mujeres, las medias duraderas eran un gran progreso, pero la alegría duró poco. My father worked for DuPont before and after the war in the nylon division. And he told me a story about how when nylon first came out and they were trying it out for use in stockings, the men in his division were asked to take these stockings home for their wives and girlfriends to try out. My father brought them home to my mother and she was delighted with the first products because they were so sturdy. Los químicos de Dupont tenían motivos para estar orgullosos. Incluso los hombres admiraban la resistencia de las medias de nylon. The problem was they lasted too long. The women were very happy with the fact that they didn't get runners in them. Unfortunately, this meant that the companies producing the stockings were not going to sell very many. Dupont dio nuevas instrucciones al padre de Nichols Fox y sus colegas. For the men in his division, it was back to the drawing board to try to make the fibers weaker and come out with something that was more fragile and would run so that the stockings wouldn't last as long. Los mismos químicos que habían aplicado todo su saber para crear un nylon duradero siguieron la corriente de la época y lo hicieron más frágil. Ese hilo eterno desapareció de las fábricas. Igual que en el cine. We need control of this discovery. Complete control. If you want twice the amount in that contract, we will pay it. A quarter of a million. Just suppress it. Yes. ¿Qué opinaban los químicos de Dupont de reducir la vida de un producto deliberadamente? Excuse me. Must have been frustrating for the engineers to have to use their skills to make an inferior product after they'd tried so hard to make a good product. But, um... In a way, I suppose, that's the outsider's view. Probably they just had a job to do. Make it strong, make it weak. That was their job. Engineers were in a really complicated, ethical time. This uh, confrontation with planned obsolescence provoked them to examine their most basic ethical concepts. There was an old school of engineers who believed that they should make a permanent, usable product that would never break. And there was a new school of engineers that were driven by the market who were clearly interested in making the most uh, despised.